Gates of the Afterlife, Part 1 Where am I? Kyle asked himself before sitting up in a bed which was not his own, in a red scrubs-like outfit, which he had not bought. The sheets he had just removed from his warm body were as white as the clouds. He looked around and saw many more people arising from their sleep as well in this vast, pearl-white dorm-style room. It had no windows and only one entrance. Although most others also wore red, a few curiously donned white. He heard multiple languages throughout the facility. Rows of similarly white-sheeted beds which he assumed belonged to the others sat perfectly in line, wall to wall. More people awoke as Kyle attempted to discern why he was here and who these strangers were. Others also arose from their slumber while a few were already speaking in groups, presumably trying to figure out the same thing Kyle was. Although he knew no one, he saw a few people that actually looked related. When he went to approach what looked like a mother and daughter, Kyle realized they didn't even speak English and seemed as confused about the whole ordeal as he was. Lowering his head, he walked back and sat on his bed. Men, women, and children of all shapes, sizes, and colors looked around in the quest for information. The last thing he remembered was having to work late the day before, not getting home, not how he got home, not anything more than just having to work. Did he get in an accident and suffer a concussion on the way back yesterday, and was in some new hospital he hadn't heard about? At least it was what seemed like yesterday. But now he was unsure. Kyle stared at the doorway, hoping his daughter or at least someone he knew would appear at any moment. Next to his bed was a boy just getting up from what seemed like a great sleep. He turned to the boy and asked, Hey buddy, which hospital is this? My memory's not as good as it used to be. I don't know, he replied and wiped his eyes. I was in class and then I woke up here. I probably had another asthma attack. Hmm, Kyle grunted, scratching his head and looking up at the ceiling. Squinting his eyes, he saw what appeared to be white cloud-like gas hovering above. In fact, it was so dense that he couldn't even see the ceiling. Passing the eyes of the other patients, which scanned his every movement, he walked to the entrance, which no one seemed to be using for some reason. The closer Kyle got, the more he realized that he couldn't actually see through it. It was like a thick haze covered the entire doorway, blurring what lay beyond. He reached his hand out and tried to push through with the full weight of his body. Now he understood that no one else tried to go through it because it was impenetrable. Cool tech, Kyle thought, halfway frustrated and half impressed by the enigma. After the initial admiration, he threw his hands up and yelled, Hey! Who's in there? I need to let my family know where I am! Still, there was no response as the others around him maintained their tight-lipped and wide-eyed faces. After a few more attempts at entering, he looked back and asked whoever would listen, What the hell is going on? A man with a drawl and not nearly as many lines on his face as Kyle approached and answered, That's what we're trying to figure out. He extended his hand, introducing himself as Trent. Nice to meet you, he continued. I'm a police officer in Miller County. Miller County? Kyle asked. I'm not too familiar with that area and I'm a real estate agent. Is that out east? We live in Orange. Well, not too sure where Orange is, but Miller's a little east of the Ozarks. The Ozarks? Missouri? The two men looked at each other as their foreheads crinkled and spaces between their eyelids grew thinner. I don't understand, Kyle replied. The last thing I remember is being at work yesterday and now I'm here. Wait, what day is it? It should be Monday, someone else heard and answered. We went out to eat yesterday at a nice place. Me and my roommate try to make a habit out of doing that on Sundays. Anyway, the next thing I know I'm waking up with a bunch of strangers. Monday? Kyle asked. The woman nodded. That can't be right either. I specifically remember going into work yesterday and making plans with my daughter to play golf Saturday. Which would be today? By now the group around the entrance multiplied as newcomers wanted answers. I was in the middle of a Patriots game for Thursday night football, another added. And I was on my way home from a date after work Wednesday in Miami, a woman said. Miami, Kyle repeated. So we've established that we're all from different places. This is insane. Does anyone know how they got here? No one was able to answer. Who do you think took us? Another woman asked. Don't know, but I plan to find out, Trent replied while continuing to take stock of the room. Last thing I remember is having an hour left to go on my shift and getting a call for a drunk. Where the hell are we? Someone asked. Well, at least we know we won't be here long, Trent replied. How do you know that? Kyle asked. Look at the place. There isn't anything. No, restrooms or even water fountains. Just beds. So we were only meant to sleep here, Kyle agreed. 
They all began going around the room looking for an exit until hearing a commotion toward the entrance. It's open, someone yelled as the crowd rushed through. Someone knocked Kyle over before he could do the same. His 56-year-old bones picked himself back up before continuing to follow. Finally making it through, they now found themselves in another room twice the size of the one they left filled with pearl-white seats just large enough for a person. Even more, names were engraved in blue on the back of each one. This auditorium, like the room before, was windowless, but there was yet another entrance, the same size as the last on the opposite side of the room, and just the same, no one could see or get through it. Some people even found their own names on the chairs. Soon, everyone, including Kyle, found theirs before sitting and waiting in them. As Kyle sat, trying to remember what happened, Trent came over. I think we need to get out of here. Looks like we might have been kidnapped, he said. A woman accompanied him. She was a brunette, the commanding type with piercing green eyes, accentuated by the red clothing. Who would want to do that? Kyle asked, arising from his seat. That's what I intend to find out. Oh, this is Rachel. Hi, I work with intelligence, she said, shaking hands with Kyle. More people should, he replied. Rachel gave no reaction, a slight blow to his ego. So what do you think this is? Kyle asked. It's probably an international human trafficking ring. The problem is we have to figure out why we were selected, she answered. Kyle put his hands on his hips. I'm pretty successful. Sounds like the two of you have got well-paying jobs. Could it have anything to do with that? Maybe they want money? Astute observation, but I spoke with a few people and don't think that's the case. I just met two brothers who are Uber drivers, so there goes that theory, she continued. The three searched for an exit in vain until noticing a commotion at the unexplored entrance. Smoke from the doorway billowed into the large room as the haze cleared, revealing a tall, middle-aged woman dressed in a long, dark purple gown. She walked in, almost gliding, and up the stairs to the stage before standing behind the podium and looking down on the crowd as they readied themselves to listen. At first, Kyle, Trent, Rachel, and most of the others stood with their arms folded waiting for answers, yet the woman continued to only observe their movements, her eyes piercing through the soles of their focus. Where the hell are we? Someone screamed. I'm suing every goddamn person that runs this place, another followed. The uproar increased as others demanded to be released. Without warning, she raised her hand, silencing the crowd. You will be released, she calmly stated. Now they were all ears as their mouths remained open. Kyle began to make his way to the front. Reaching close enough where he could touch her feet, he raised his hand and asked, Miss, where are we? She looked toward him and then back to the crowd before smiling and said, You are all dead. And this is your judgment. The occupants panicked, knocking each other over, some trying to get through the doorway, others looking for alternate escape routes, and the remainder trying to rush the stage. She again lifted her hand with such speed it drew Kyle's attention, although he struggled to maintain his balance from the bodies that went in multiple directions around him. What seemed like a strong gust of wind quickly pushed everyone back, causing a deep, deafening shrill in their ears. The dazed group regained their balance and finally arose from their sprawled positions on the floor and across the chairs. They looked up at the woman who now began to levitate above the floor. As Kyle arose, he began to remember. Flashback. For the third time, Kyle looked down at his watch. It was cold and he was ready to go home. The last people always take the longest, he thought. 6.15, we ran into traffic. He read the new text. They were supposed to be there at 6. Kyle didn't bother responding. Finally, at about 6.20, just as he pulled his phone out again to tell them that he was leaving, a car pulled into the driveway. It was a Camry that looked like it had been in more than a few wrecks and was nearly the same age as Kyle. Interesting car to drive when interested in a $2 million home, he thought. Hey, sorry, bro, the driver said after parking right behind Kyle's Mercedes. The vehicle's paint was faded from neglectful years while small bubbles revealed themselves within the dark tint covering the windows. The driver was a tall guy wearing a dark hoodie and flat-brimmed Dodgers cap. Accompanying him was another young male passenger wearing a gray sweater and jeans. They both had dark sneakers on which was a stark contrast from the leather loafers he's accustomed to seeing, Baluti cursive specifically. Um, yeah, no problem, Kyle approached. Adam? Yeah, that's me. I brought my brother Mark with me. He wanted to check it out. Thought it would be a good idea since he might be living with me. 
Right, so you said over the phone that you work in media. Yeah, we help people build their media presence. Do you have a company name or... Look, man, we just as busy as you. If you could get us in and out, that would be great because we've got a whole nother meeting at 7. Oh, yeah, I... Well, I just wanted to make sure you were good with the price and... Yeah, man, we can afford it, he interrupted. Al, all right. Well, let's take a look, Kyle said, motioning toward the door while retrieving the key from his pocket. You've got a nice car out here, Adam mentioned as Kyle's hands trembled while he struggled to unlock the front entrance. It was sleek and black with tinted windows also, minus the bubbles. Yay. Yeah, it's my baby, he replied, finally getting the door open. So do you work with a partner or is it just you? Oh, um, it's just me. I think it's more personal, Kyle replied, closing it behind them. Yeah, that's why I took my job, Adam said. I mean, besides the pay, I only got to work with one client. It's definitely a plus, he replied after finding the available light switch. So yeah, this is the main hallway leading into the living room. Oh, and like you, I've really got to get going after this, but don't feel too rushed. We won't, Adam corrected him. All right, so let's start upstairs. That way we can just end the showing as we go out. After getting off the elevator, the doors opened up to a vast ballroom which led down a wide hall. The bedrooms were staggered, left to right, five in total. The master suite at the end was well over 800 feet. On the edge was a balcony portraying a view of the city skyline showing every skyscraper located downtown and the lights to illuminate the night sky above. Speaking of the balcony, it overlooked the pool and jacuzzi located below in the backyard. After completing the upstairs viewing, they were now at the end of the hall looking down a spiral staircase. Adam's brother looked at him and said under his breath, Damn, an elevator and stairs? But Kyle overheard him. Seems a little pretentious, yes, Kyle began. But the previous owner's wife had an accident which left her immobile, which is why they put both access ways in. Since we're here, let's just go back down this way and check the stairs out, Adam insisted. They stood at the top of the second floor, overlooking the long, winding stairs below them. The two hadn't said much more than this during their tour. Of course, please, Kyle motioned them to go first. They made their way down the stairs that were now darkened by the sunset taking place outside. Excuse me, he said, pushing past his potential clients to hurry to the light switch located at the bottom. Kyle stumbled at the end, having to hold himself up. He turned on the lights for the two who would no doubt need it before looking back and seeing that they were already down. He approached and said, So that was the upstairs. What do you think so far? Adam turned toward him as his brother continued to stroll around, touching every item Kyle began doubting they could afford in sight and responded, Pretty cool spot. Right, anyway, so here's the kitchen. If you guys want to follow me, Kyle gestured. The two traded glances before accompanying him. It was the biggest kitchen they had seen, though they wouldn't let Kyle know this. It had a huge island in the middle that looked as long as two twin-sized beds put together, and as wide, too. So, what do you think? Kyle asked. Adam was slow to answer, taking time to more completely observe his surroundings. I like the island, although it's more like a peninsula. We grew up with a smaller egg-shaped type. Hmm, then this is a huge upgrade. It was recently converted into a U-shape. Yeah, fiancé will like this one. She'll probably want to add a full overlay to those, Adam mentioned, pointing to the cabinets behind them. Oh, you have a fiancé? Sounds fantastic. This place is an excellent choice for new couples. And your brother will be living with you as well? He asked, looking at Mark. It's certainly big enough for... It's even bigger down here, Mark interrupted after passing the dining room as he stared at the pool through the glass door. Oh, I'll get that for you, Kyle rushed over, unlocking the entrance. The three men walked out soft green grass under their shoes into a backyard that seemed better suited to house a small sports tournament rather than be attached to someone's home. Kyle hit the lights near the doorway, illuminating the area. LED lights ran along the Olympic-sized pool as well as the jacuzzi, which was the size of a normal residence's pool. Mark circled the bodies of water, taking in all of his brother's possible future belongings. Adam and Kyle continued to discuss the home as they walked through the garden, placed there by the previous owner's daughter. So what do you think? Kyle asked after they exited the garden and walked back toward the doors. Adam took a deep breath, looked around, smiled and said, I love it, much to Kyle's chagrin. Oh, what's the security system like? It's on the other side of the house and really is state-of-the-art, technology-wise. It's, may I see it? Adam interrupted. 
Uh, sure. Um, where's your brother? Oh, he's probably still checking the place out on his own. He'll find us. Kyle knew the protocol. Never let a client, and especially the guest of a client, out of sight. But since they were nearing the end, he knew they would be done soon, so it didn't matter anyway. They reached the security hut tucked off in a corner of the yard, which was attached to the overall system. After Kyle turned on the system, Adam saw that this 12 by 12 foot room was equipped with cameras showing the entire home and both yards, including hundreds of feet beyond the driveway. So what do you think, Kyle asked, escorting his potential client out and back toward the home. I think it's a great opportunity. Just have one more place to check out tomorrow and then I'll make my decision. When the two men reached the back door after noticing, Kyle asked, Where's your brother? Oh, he's already back in the car. He texted me that he likes it too. Okay. Well, let's head out and any more questions you have for me. Don't hesitate to reach out and... Boom! Kyle's head began to throb as he fell in the backyard. Trying to see through his blurry vision, which now had a red tint overlapping, all he could make out was a figure or two towering above. He heard what sounded like running water faucet as the lights around him dimmed before quickly fading to black. Part 2 the mysterious woman began to speak, saying, Hear ye all the few of you in white have lived your lives in such a way that you have been accepted into heaven. As you can see, the vast majority of you are in red, which as you could have expected means that you have been condemned to hell. This has got to be a joke, Kyle said, leaving his seat and pushing past everyone to get to the front before Trent, who decided for some reason to jump on the stage and confront the woman who seemed unshaken. Ma'am, I am a police officer and will have you arrested. Who are you? My name is not important, Officer Messler, she replied, turning toward him. Only your fate. Only the courts decide fate, Trent said. Rachel stepped up and asked as she looked up. What is that? An old Egyptian dialect? Nice touch. A young man covered in tattoos took this opportunity, also leaping on the stage before taking hold of the woman from behind. Multiple people stare while others try rushing through the door in vain. Suddenly, the man who had taken hold of the woman on stage caught fire. His entire body seemed to almost instantaneously morph into hundreds of flames as he crumbled to the floor beside the figure. Somehow, although she was directly next to him, not a hair on her body was scorched, nor were her clothes any worse for the wear as she began levitating feet above the floor. That's murder, someone yelled. You must wait here until you are judged, the woman commanded. What about food? Where can we use the restroom? A mother and daughter asked. We have no use for restrooms in the afterlife, and what you call food only serve as pleasures in this world, she said, as she walked directly through the crowd past Kyle and out the entrance. The occupants looked around in horror and astonishment. Is this real? Someone asked. She's levitating, another mentioned. Maybe it's some kind of new technology similar to the door, Trent said. Rachel turned and asked, But what about the burning man? That sure didn't look like special effects, hence the burning flesh. I don't think this is a joke, Kyle said. I'm not sure about being dead, but I sure know that I was attacked last night. Or whenever that was. Trent scratched his head before putting his hand to his chin. I'll be damned. It's starting to come back a little. The others leaned in. Well, I for sure remember pulling over a pickup right late. As a matter of fact, the guy was drinking. Anything else? Kyle asked. Nope. That's about all I can remember. Wait a minute, Rachel said. I know what happened to me. The group looked at her all at once. I was really tired after a long shift since I had to put in extra overtime on a DEA stakeout in New Mexico I helped to oversee. Well, I was supposed to help oversee. Anyway, I remember falling asleep on the road for what I thought was just a second before some speedster clipped me from the back. That's all I remember, but it suggests that whatever happened after is the reason I'm here. The reason we're all here, Kyle said. Wait a minute, Trent said, pushing through the crowd as Kyle and Rachel looked at each other with squinted eyes. Wait a fucking minute! Finally reaching his destination, Trent grabs a skinny young black man by the arm. Also, this man was one of the only ones in the entire room wearing white instead of red. Whoa, what the hell are you doing? He said, snatching himself away. Trent continued until he was completely in his personal space and stuck his index finger out mere inches from his face. What you doing, man? He pulled back and asked. Don't I know you? Trent asked, eyes locked on his face, finger now trembling. 
The man looked at him for a few seconds before gasping quickly backing away into the others and putting his hands in a halfway defensive posture. Officer Messler? Wait, you the same cop that killed me? What the fuck is this? Trent lowered his hand, barely able to stop his slowly opening mouth as his eyes widened also. What the hell kind of game is this? A man continued. You, you killed me, man. How you here? The others looked on. He's a killer, he said. This man killed me for jaywalking. The crowd looked at each other, then at Trent. The woman on stage continued to gaze from above, seemingly enjoyed by the conversation. Trent, now out of his shock, looked around at the audience before turning back to the man, retorting, Hey man, all you had to do was not cross the road. It's a light for a reason. Is that a reason to die? You weren't shot because you jaywalked. You were shot because you were reaching for a we- I was reaching for my phone. Either way, if an officer stops, you don't turn around and go reaching in your po- I didn't turn around. You didn't even give me the chance. As soon as you rolled up in your blue and whites, you grabbed me and tried to throw me down. Well, you shouldn't have been resisting. The hell with resisting. You barely told me what you were stopping me for before you put those dirty ass hands on me. I was grabbing my phone because when you was trying to throw me down, it was about to fall out. And plus, I wanted to record. Looks like I was right to want to, too. Maybe you wouldn't have got away with it. Y'all do us dirty down there, the man said, shaking his head. Do you even know my name? Trent, raising his head slowly along with his furrowed brow, asked, Mark? The man smirked, correcting him, saying, Mac, but close. Mac took a step toward Trent before he could feel his breath, noses inches from each other. Did it feel good? Mac asked. Noticing the look on his killer's face, he clarified, Killing me, I mean. The two stared at each other before someone said, Wait, I remember that story. The speaker, an older man, pointed his finger towards Mac. Mac Gurley, right? Mac turned from Trent to look at the man walking toward them, saying, Yeah, that's right. And you're that cop Messler, right? He said, pointing his shaking finger at Trent. That's me, but I remember that case. It was about a week ago all over the news before it died out. All cause you said he was reaching. I remember that too, a few others said. The man looked back toward Mac. But how are you here now? Don't know, Mac replied. Been here for about a week. Thought it was a hospital at first. Just kept waking up and going back to sleep. Talking to who I could to try to find out what's going on. But wait, the man interrupted. How did you know you were dead? I thought you thought it was a hospital. I did at first. That was until I noticed the bullet holes were gone with no scars. I know hospitals these days pretty good, but they ain't that good. With this came an idea to Kyle as he raised his hand to feel the back of his head accidentally slapping it before realizing that the wounds he had remembered getting from the men were no longer there. Is that true it was just for a cell phone? Rachel asked Trent. He slowly turned his bowed head to look back at her as he bit his lip, but before he could respond, they noticed the man in a dark brown robe silently entering. Not walking, but more like floating, he glided past the others who nearly fell trying to get out of his way. Approaching the stage, the air itself seemed to lift him up and next to the woman who stood in front of the podium. Before anyone could react, he pointed at a man about midway in the thick crowd. The others looked back, shying away. As the crowd dispersed, Kyle could make out a clearer picture of the man. He was a stocky Asian man dressed in red in his twenties with long hair and covered in tattoos. Li Yang, the specter said, continuing pointing. The look of confusion followed by apprehension before a cascading defiance fell on Lee's face. You will now be judged, the figure said. No, Lee said, but an unknown force like two large invisible security guards took hold and began carrying him to the stage as he fought knocking over all in their way. They continue to carry Lee out the entrance to the shock of the others wondering if they will be next. Some even got on their knees to pray. Others sat down, hands on their heads while still more paced the room muttering to themselves. Someone took stock of the room and noticed that the reds outnumbered those dressed in white at least sixty to one. The groups began to discuss amongst themselves why they had been dressed differently. Kyle, too, noticed the difference not only in color but overall appearance as well. The ones like him dressed in red seemed a little more nervous or maybe edgy than their counterparts. When he counted, there were only twelve whites to the hundreds like himself. Besides Mac, the majority were either very old people or very young, including the asthmatic boy he spoke with earlier. He could only assume what most expected to be the case. If this was truly their final judgment, those in white were heaven-bound, and the ones in red like him had a different destination. 
This created an immediate rift within the facility as the few whites grouped together to tell their stories. A wrinkled man barely able to walk died of a heart attack only an hour after the passing of his wife of 70 years. A teacher in her 50s died from a school shooting after going back to rescue more children only to meet the gunman at the doorway. A 63-year-old doctor at a children's hospital passed away from cancer while continuing to volunteer in between chemo sessions. These were just a few of the stories from those in white. Reds, on the other hand, were left in either solitude or to complain amongst themselves. Most wouldn't admit to all if any transgressions on their parts, which was a stark contrast to the whites, who, although had uplifting stories, still told of what they feared might send them to hell. Whether it be stealing from a store when they were young, or running a light on the way to work so as to not be late. Kyle knew some reasons why he might look like an oversized ruby, although like most, he was unwilling to share with strangers. Trent sat alone facing the wall while Rachel continued to question the others attempting to gain situational understanding, which she was sure to be a criminal operation. As the people continued to wonder what they had done to be dressed in red, trying to justify any wrongdoings, the rift between the colors grew wider. Still, the figure continued to come in, only to whisk away its next victim. Then, as Trent sat in the corner, it returned. Except this time, its finger now pointed at him. Trent noticed others around looking, so he turned toward the entrance, only to see the ghastly figure. Without much protesting, he got up and walked over, following it through the doorway as Kyle and Rachel watched on in horror. Immediately, Rachel came over. I can't believe what I just saw, she said. Yeah, to be honest, I was still slightly skeptical of what they said, but now seeing it happen to one of us changes things, he replied. They continued to discuss the dilemma, but it wasn't long until that same figure pointed her out. Rachel wasn't so willing to acquiesce to their demands and fought tooth and nail swinging at the mysterious forces lifting her away into the abyss and unknown all the while screaming, Let me go! Do you know who I am? When the director finds out about this, he'll bring you all down! This continued to no avail as she was thrust back while the others looked on. The whole scene made Kyle even more nervous than he was before as he sat back in his chair, dropped his head in his hands, and began to tear up. Minutes later, his eyes were still misty when he heard something behind him. Slowly turning around to see what was happening, his dread returned once again upon hearing the commotion nearby. Was it finally his time to be judged? His hands began to shake as the people around him shuffled their feet and dispersed. This time was different. It was not the same dark figure that they had been accustomed to seeing, but instead what seemed like an angel. A woman in her thirties dressed in all white and who seemed to be literally glowing entered the room. But like her counterpart, she too floated, yet was far more graceful in her movements. Unlike him, however, she did not point, but instead continued toward the others. They watched hands on their faces, wondering what her next move would be. She finally arrived at a man now familiar to all those in the room. This man was wearing white. At first, he put up his hands to create space between him and this beautiful, radiating woman. She continued to smile and slowly lifted her hands toward him. Come, she said. He is waiting. This seemed to calm Mac more than anything he had ever experienced as a smile on his face formed beginning to match her own. He took hold of her hand before she turned around and led him back out the exit. Once they were gone, everyone erupted in conversation, wondering now more fervently than ever what they had done to deserve wearing red. They eyed the whites menacingly, but their counterparts, however, were happier now than they had ever been as they rejoiced amongst themselves, and some even out in the open. It wasn't long before Kyle was summoned. By then, he had already somewhat accepted that this was indeed real. Like Trent, he did not fight the figure, but fear gripped every ounce of his being. They approached the entrance and then through. Kyle immediately saw two sets of stairs, one was going up and the other down. They moved like escalators, but far more advanced. They continued to walk past the stairs to another entrance at the end of the room. As they did, Kyle looked to see the stairs going up and heard what sounded like singing and beautiful music coming from the top. He continued to try to get a peek, but was blinded by the brightness above. They passed the stairs going down and Kyle grew warm. He couldn't help but hear what sounded like blood-curdling screams coming from below as a red glow of light illuminated the bottom. Despite his attire, they passed this stairwell also until reaching another doorway. The figure said nothing, only gesturing to Kyle to go in. Unable to protest, he entered what seemed to be a small waiting room and sat down immediately noticing two other occupants. 
It was a mother and daughter, but there was something strange. The daughter wore white, but the mother was in red. But mommy, the daughter asked, why do you have red on? The mother glanced at Kyle before quickly averting her eyes back and responded, I don't know, honey, but it's going to be all right, and hugged the adolescent. Unable to hold back tears, she began to cry, which led the daughter to do the same. Trying to ignore the whole ordeal, Kyle looked down at his hands, and for the first time since he had been there, he hadn't felt so bad about his own situation. Moments later, the same glowing woman from before entered. The mother and daughter begin crying even more despite the smiling face in front of them. Like before, she reached her hand towards the child in white. The young girl noticed, but turned away, holding on even tighter as she grasped her mother's arm. Seeing that the mother was also unwilling to let go, the woman lightly placed her hand on the girl's shoulder. Almost immediately, she felt better, relieved in a sense, and wiped her eyes, saying, It'll be okay, Mom. I'm going to a better place, she continued before taking hold of her mother's hands and standing the both of them up. No, the mother pleaded. Please, is there any way? She asked, looking toward the woman, but was given no response. It'll be okay, her daughter said. Then for the first time she spoke. Say goodbye to your daughter, she replied. She will be happy. They looked at each other one last time and embraced tighter than they ever had before. At first she was not able to let go of her child, but could not fight the mysterious forces that restrained her. Unwilling to accept the truth, she still tried with every fiber of her being to hold on, but her hand seemed to just slip away. She watched the woman and her daughter fade away, backing out of the room as her outstretched hands pointed in their direction. Crying uncontrollably, she fell to the floor in hysterics. This was the most uncomfortable Kyle had ever remembered being as he leaned toward the corner of the room away from the screaming woman. Fortunately for him, though, he didn't have to put up with it for long because soon after her daughter left, she was also summoned. The menacing figure nicknamed the Collector of Reds by some came back to the door and pointed at the woman. Despite her sure fate, she arose from the floor. Her tears had turned her red shirt maroon and still continued to flow as she followed the figure with no objection out of sight. Soon after, Kyle too was summoned by the dark specter, yet instead of going toward the downward stairwell, they went towards another room. This was much larger than the one he had been in before. There were two chairs across from each other. One seemed more like a throne than anything else, while the other was akin to a small bench. Kyle sat on the bench and waited in the otherwise empty room, looking down in contemplation. So you're Kyle, someone said before he immediately looked up and saw that there was a man he had not noticed come in now sitting across from him. Um, yes, he replied. What, what, who, who are you? The man looked to be from the Middle East and wore a silky white robe. He had long hair almost like dreads and piercing green eyes. Seconds passed until he responded, I am Julius and responsible for your judgment. Speechless, Kyle only stared back before asking, Am I going to hell? Julius, unchanging in his expression, leaned forward and said, That was your sentence. This is your judgment. Part 3 Kyle looked at the man across from him as his eyes grew wide. This has got to be a joke. What the hell did I do to deserve this? I'm a good person. I never- Ah, yes. Death seems to negatively affect the memory. Allow me to assist you, Julius said, reaching toward Kyle and touching his forehead. Instantly, Kyle and Julius stood in a room adorned with a few plant vases set side by side on a window's ledge. This room felt familiar to Kyle, giving him a sense of some relief. Aligning one wall were two bookshelves filled with academia and in the middle of the room was a large desk with a desktop on one edge facing an older gentleman in a suit. Across from him was Kyle's former self. Kyle furrowed his eyebrows, looking to Julius, but before he could utter a word. So, Mr. Dohler, sorry to call you from work, but I couldn't get a hold of your wife, Deborah, Principal Jacob said. I needed to inform you that your daughter, Tara, has not been performing at our school well at all. Excuse me? Kyle asked. Yes, well, it's mainly due to her skipping classes. We've notified you by mail more than once. Deborah hasn't told me anything about this. Well, sadly, due to her grades, your daughter will not graduate. No, no, there must be something I can do. Night classes? Extra homework? Tutoring? Please, I'm sure we can figure this out. Principal Jacobs stared at Kyle and sighed. Wait! Kyle yelled, bringing his head up and pulling his hand from his chin. Don't you want to get the funding for a swim team for that son of yours, I imagine? Jacob straightened his posture, slowly drawing back and away. Let's say, for example, 
I'd be willing to donate 40000 to that and whatever else the school may need, including the debate team upgrade. Could we make something happen? Jacobs took a few breaths and looked down before looking back up again and nodding, avoiding eye contact with Kyle. Kyle extended his right arm, looking directly into Jacob's eyes while he continued to look away, but still shook hands. Within hours, 40000 was in the private school's account, and an official diploma was mailed to the Dolar home with a note attached politely, asking them not to attend the graduation. Just as instantly as they arrived, Kyle and Julius were back at the table, sitting across from each other. Surely now you do not believe in your complete innocence, Julius said. I was just doing what any father would do for his child. She has so much potential and not graduating on time would have completely thrown everything off. Besides, it was for a good cause. God is a father who gave his son so that you may even have a chance at judgment, while you hide your own daughter's inadequacies, lessening the value of a diploma and taking away from the children that worked harder than her while she was off lollygagging with a 22-year-old boyfriend you didn't know existed. Seconds passed before Kyle could say anything, as thoughts raced through his mind, and just before he opened his mouth, they were in another place and, like the other, was also familiar to Kyle. This is my first job, Kyle said. Oh, and that was my boss, Mark. Mark Bloom, he continued, pointing to a short, wide man grabbing a cup of coffee, turning around and walking into an office that read, Mark Bloom, in big, bold letters on the door. Humble beginnings, Julius mentioned, as the two began to walk around the small main office. Yeah, well, I was just starting out. They rounded a corner and saw a middle-aged, balding man standing over someone else at a computer. After continuing to approach, Kyle said, Wait, that's my old co-worker, Harold Fuller. Nicest guy ever. Seemed stressed, though. With good reason to be, Julius said. He had a pregnant wife and a four-year-old. The two continued to approach, and Kyle realized it was he that was seated while Harold hovered above. So this is the clientele database. Mark just hired me a week before you, so I'm still getting the hang of everything as well, Harold said, using his mouse to teach the up-and-coming prospect. Go ahead and take a lunch break and be back at one to go over the rest. Then maybe we can get out into the field. Wow, this is a lot, Kyle responded. I just got my license and all of a sudden I'm here. Well, it's a small office since Mr. Bloom's just starting out, so don't expect too much too soon. We don't have that many potential clients yet. I just moved my family out here from Vermont because our place closed down and this was the only job offer I could find. I've got faith, though. Harold and Kyle began to grow hazy and dissipate until they were no more as the room grew darker, turning noon to evening. Now Julius and Kyle still stood in the office, but it was another time, another day, weeks later. The door to the restroom opened and Kyle walked out, headed toward his desk and grabbed his laptop and keys. After walking to the front and locking the door, he walked back toward the exit where his car was parked. Another disappointing day, he thought. Still, the company hadn't got any clients, and the market in general was on a downturn. At least it was Friday. He was eager to go home and have a glass of wine. Just as he turned the doorknob, he heard a knock at the entrance. Curious, he turned around, approached, and opened the door. It was a couple in their thirties who had just moved out from New York. Both were lawyers, Suzanne and Tom Sizemore. Um, yes, I'm sorry we're closed. May I help you? Kyle asked. Oh, we didn't know, Tom said, looking around. We were on your website a week ago before moving and spoke to someone named Harold, who told us to swing by when we moved, Suzanne interjected. He gave me his personal number, but I lost my phone during the move. I know. Bad day, she continued, noticing Kyle's concern. We've rented out a place, but we're really looking for a place in the area, and I remember finding you guys first, Tom said. Uh, I just got off, and Harold's not here for personal reasons, but... Hmm, I, I think I could probably help you, Kyle said. Come on in, he ended, opening the door and letting them in. He closed the door and waved in the direction of his desk, saying, Let's have a seat over there and take a look at some of your options. As the three continued... It was as time began to slow, and before Kyle knew it, his former self and the Sizemores stopped completely in motion. Julius looked over to Kyle and said, Stealing clients is the same as stealing money or anything else. You are taking something that doesn't belong to you. Harold wasn't even there, Kyle snapped back. If I left a second earlier, I wouldn't even have heard them knocking. Yet you had the opportunity to give them his number. Instead, you gave yourself the opportunity. He wasn't at work that day because his wife was ill. 
I'm sorry to hear that, but I was taught that the best ability is availability, and the early bird gets the worm. He ended up quitting a few weeks later anyway. He didn't quit. He was fired. Kyle looked at Julius with his mouth barely open. Bloom fired him because he wasn't producing as much as his trainee, you. The Sizemores were very wealthy, as you well know. After closing on the huge deal with them, they introduced you to many of their new friends and clients, leading to your very own practice. Harold moved his family back to Vermont, unable to afford rent here. Luckily, he found another job, but he endured a divorce before it came to fruition. Had you not taken his client, he would have been more than willing to share some of his new clients afterward, but instead you stole what was his. After a few moments, Kyle replied, It's a capitalist society, and opportunity shouldn't be wasted. I'm sorry to hear that he got fired, but ascension based on deceit is undeserved, Julius interrupted. Before Kyle could respond, they were suddenly somewhere completely different. This place he barely remembered. They were in a large office, high above the ground with a view of the city's skyscrapers out the large window that ran from one wall to the next. Law Office of Malloy, a large sign read on one of the walls. In the middle of the room was a long table with chairs on the side and one on each end. On one end was Kyle's son Liam's lawyer, Attorney Malloy, and at the other was Attorney Susie Gerrand. Next to Malloy was Liam, who was seated between his attorney and father. Across the table were an older couple, Marco and Katie Wilkerson. Katie looked like she had just finished crying as Marco, with his arm around her, stared at Liam, eyes burning into his soul. Kyle and Liam on one hand were both dressed in expensive suits, donning matching Cartiers. Katie had put on her best dress, the same that she had worn at the last day of the trial when the verdict was read and she had broken down in the courtroom. It was a nice little gray dress Marco had purchased online, the only one he could afford while he wore the same suit he had purchased 12 years ago. Let's get to business, shall we? Malloy suggested, opening up his laptop. So hopefully we can settle this today. We've been at it for months. If we can avoid a civil trial, then that would be best, Susie added. My clients surely have gone through quite enough. Agreed, Malloy stated. What is the request? Considering that the defendant served less than a year for the crime, I believe that my clients are entitled to at least 15 million, Susie said. Hmm, Malloy murmured, sitting back in his comfortable leather chair as his eyes searched the ceiling. Well, the charges were reduced to involuntary. I understand that, but if this goes to court, the judge will likely rule in our favor. I mean, it was a big case and DUIs are frowned upon. We're guaranteed to get something. True, but that 15 million isn't guaranteed. Besides, my client wrecked while on prescribed medications. A simple accident which was already prov- He took four times the amount he was prescribed, she interrupted. He also took our daughter, Marco said, still focused on Liam. This was the first time he had spoken during the meeting, and also the first time the Wilkerson's stood face to face with the man who took their daughter's life five years before. After losing the criminal trial, their only hope at redemption was a civil one, in which they could not afford, a fact that Malloy knew all too well. Let me do the talking, please, Mr. Wilkerson, Susie whispered, placing a hand on his forearm before glancing briefly and Liam then looking back toward Malloy. The family has been grieving for years and apologize for any outburst, but we just need this settled. Malloy, who had been on his phone, put it down and looked up, saying, Five million seems a little more appropriate in this matter. That should be well enough to cover the court costs, lawyer fees, and any emotional distress. Katie gasped as she looked at her husband in shock while his eyes now locked on Malloy, screaming with derision. Five million doesn't even begin to cover the emotional costs, Susie said. As you know, Marlena was killed on prom night in a situation that could have completely been avoided. The last time my client saw their daughter was when she was picked up by, uh, Mr. Innes, her boyfriend. Luckily, he survived the crash, but you settled with him for six million, so I know we are entitled to more than that. Well, again, that's for the court to decide. Should there be a need? Suddenly, Kyle spoke up, asking Malloy, Could we have a five-minute recess? I need to speak with you privately. Susie agreed, and Malloy, Kyle, and Liam left the room. Julius and Kyle followed the three out to the main lobby area. What do you need? Malloy asked once the door was closed. Look, I understand that I had to already shell out five for the boyfriend and you're trying to keep the costs down. 
but I'm fully willing and able to give the fifteen million if it'll bring an end to all of this. Only seems right with what happened to their daughter. Yes. Sad situation all around, but let's see what they say to ten. Keep in mind you still have the divorce that may come down to the wire. Michael's been working on that. Liam stood facing away from the men, looking out another window, lost in thought. The three men came back into the room and took their original seats. Susie was typing on her laptop while her clients were in a deep discussion. Just as Liam was about to sit, Marco leaped out at him. Despite both Katie and Susie trying to hold him back, he managed to grab Liam's tie, pulling him toward him. Kyle and Malloy intervened, freeing Liam after a brief struggle, and Marco was asked to leave. Once it was confirmed that he left the building, the meeting continued. Not very civil, Kyle mentioned, sitting back down. No, not at all, Malloy added. Let it be known that he is not authorized to re-enter the facility, and if there are any more outbursts, he said, looking at Katie, whose tears had made it from her eyes and were now resting on her chin, then the meeting will be conducted by attorneys only. Understood, Susie said, holding on to Katie's hand. All right. After speaking with my client, we are willing to ignore the assault charge just incurred by Mr. Wilkerson and boost our offer up to ten million to satisfy the case. The two women whispered to each other a few moments before Susie looked back toward Malloy, saying, Thirteen. Ten, Malloy repeated. And if that's unacceptable, then we will have to hash it out in court, which could take another five years. After taking a deep breath and looking down, Susie looked back up to her client and whispered. Katie ran her fingers through her long, black and gray hair, squeezing her head between her hands before looking back to her attorney and nodding. Deal, Susie said, looking back toward Malloy as Kyle audibly exhaled while his son remained unattached. The two attorneys shook hands before Susie and Katie left, leaving the three men at the table. Worked out well enough, Malloy said, looking at his laptop and nodding his head. Kyle just looked over to his son, who was now halfway turned around in his chair, looking out the huge window at all of the people go by, still silent. The men paused in time as present-day Kyle walked over to Liam. Kyle continued to glance between him and the window, wondering what his son was looking at before landing his eyes on Liam's face, taken aback by his eyes which seemed to be nearly overflowing with fluid as a set of tears rolled down his face inch by inch. What's wrong? Why is, was he crying? Liam turned to ask Julius. I don't understand. We won the case. Julius walked up to the two, looking at Kyle and asked, but what did you lose? Kyle squinted his eyes as his mouth barely opened, devoid of words before looking back toward his son, then down and away. But before he could answer, everything turned hazy, and again, they were back in the small room sitting across from each other. Kyle looked around as his breathing increased, saying, Wait, take me back. I want to see my son again. Please, I haven't seen him in years. The past is behind us for a reason, Julius answered. You must focus on the present. The family your son affected wanted to see their daughter as well. I made it right. The victims were compensated. No good would have come of Liam going to jail. Besides, a conviction like that may have hindered his future, Kyle yelled, now standing. Or it may have saved it, Julius said, still seated. I don't understand. This isn't fair. Everything you've showed me I've had a good reason for. Good is what humans call the actions they believe are right when they aren't looking for God's guidance. And what of your love for gambling and strong drink? I was looking for a release with the gambling. There was so much going on in my life. I was stressed out and going through a divorce. Besides, I had the money anyway. There never was a man who found true lasting peace by looking outwardly. When you weren't drinking and gambling, you worshipped money. As much time as you had spent at your office, it seems you also love work more than your own creator. How am I supposed to love someone I don't even know ever existed? Continuing to choose evil for lack of fear of consequence is no excuse, Julia said, now standing. You had every opportunity to believe in something, yet you chose only yourself. This isn't due to any lack of evidence, but simply because most humans find it too difficult. Had you at least tried to believe in something other than the reliance of your own understanding, you would have found a gravel road leading to gold. Instead, you chose a road paved with gold leading to the furnace. Everyone makes mistakes. There is a difference between a mistake and a conscious decision, Julius said, walking up to Kyle, who walked backward until feeling the wall behind him. For these reasons, Julius continued, 
I hereby sentence you to an eternity in hell for your sins of lust, gluttony, greed, envy, and pride, among many others. Part 4. Kyle stands there for several moments as Julius walks back to his chair and sits down. Several more moments pass before Kyle, looking toward the wall, looks back to Julius and says, Please, so is this the end? Julius looked away and then back at him as a smile began to form on the right edge of his lips, saying, No, I've peered into your soul and found that it can be redeemed. What? What does that mean? Kyle asked, a smile beginning to form on his face as he approached. This means you will be sent to trial and if found guilty, sent to hell. But first there are still requirements to be approved of trial. Kyle, not looking at his seat, grabbed his chair and sat back down. You must go to the nether realm. What's the nether realm? It's a place for lost souls, looking to complete the same tasks you must. What do I need to do? You must find someone from your past who you've wronged to forgive you. Also, you will have to forgive someone else who has wronged you. Before you ask, it can't be the same person. Kyle lowered his hand and closed his mouth before opening again and asking, But what if I don't find anyone? If you do not complete the necessary tasks within 75 years, you will be sent to hell straight away. But how do I find the- Kyle was thrown into a whirlwind, spiraling as he became dizzy in a sea of black, blue, and purple. Everything became dark and then black as he began to fall, suspended in space, what seemed to him like hours passed before everything was still. It was an overcast day when he awoke alongside a dirt road leading to a gloomy forest the size of the city he lived in. He was clear-headed with no injury. Kyle sat up, looking around and saw there were many more roads, miles and miles away, all leading to the forest. Kyle stood, got on the road and began walking toward the forest. There were no animals in this dark forest but people in abundance. None he knew, but like him, were all dressed in red. Hours turned into days, days into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years as Kyle would strike up conversations with people he'd meet out of boredom in this never-ending forest. One day while walking on one of the many dirt paths, he saw a curly-haired stocky man coming toward him. They made eye contact and Kyle thought he recognized him before the man looked away, somewhat scowling and hastened his steps. Despite this, Kyle stopped and said, Hey, excuse me, do I know you? The man who was already past him, turned around standing there gazing at Kyle for a moment before approaching and coming to a stop when they were face to face. You know exactly who I am, the man said. The nerve of you to even ask that question, he stepped back, looking him up and down. Oh, still don't remember, he asked, noticing the glazed over look in Kyle's eyes. Here, I'll give you a chance, the man offered, moving back and forth. Two words, the spectrum. Albert, Kyle said, remembering his very first job. It was at a movie theater in the mall. Although his grandfather forced him to work, Kyle was allowed to choose his own job. His decision was influenced by a girl he liked that worked at a store beside the food court. Obviously, he snarled. Oh, oh my God, you were my first boss. It's so goo- Well, under the circumstances, I mean, but I was barely able to recognize you. You're so much older, but I, I guess we all are. Anyway, I'm just happy to see someone I know. Uh-huh, Albert replied, staring at this person who seemed so happy to see him. I take it you don't remember when you worked there. Kyle squinted his eyes and looked down for a moment before looking back up and saying, No, I mean, I remember it decently well. It was my first job and I just started working there, but I think you ended up quitting or something. Albert jerked his head back, tilting it, repeating, Quitting? What do you mean, quit? Kyle's mind raced as he ran his hand through his hair, scratching his head and saying, Yeah, I mean, that's what I thought, he said before being cut off by a distant memory. Kyle was in high school when he started working at the theater. His friend, who also worked there, helped him get the job. It was perfect since Jessica was the girl he had a crush on since he met her in his chemistry class a year ago when they were both sophomores. Her parents wanted her to work too, but unlike him, she did as well, and actually seemed to enjoy it. They'd talk every now and again when he would come over and pretend to look at shoes, but she knew all along his motives, and had the same when she would start randomly appearing to ask Kyle if there were any new good movies he thought she would enjoy. After about a month at the theater, his dreams came to fruition, and she became his first serious girlfriend. Maybe she was using him for the movies, but he didn't care as long as she at least pretended to like him. Albert seemed to have a temper, but liked him, 
and after months had passed, he was promoted to the role of an usher, where he would clean out the theaters after a movie would be let out as well as keep the general area clean. While he wasn't cleaning, he was either talking to Jess or watching movies. As he grew more comfortable, he began letting his friends in for free through the back door when Albert wasn't around. Soon after word got out that he worked there, others from his school and even their parents sometimes would ask if he could sneak them in if they paid. After doing that a while, sometimes making hundreds of dollars in a week, Albert caught on to it and fired him. I'm sorry, Kyle said, looking back toward Albert after remembering what he did. I shouldn't have been doing that and I don't think I ever apologized. After you quit, I... You keep saying I quit when you know it's bullshit, when you know it isn't true. His voice raised as he took a step toward Kyle. I don't understand. Kyle took a step back, partially turning away and said, This is rich. Albert laughed, shaking his head as he looked up to the sky. After I fired your butt, someone bought the theater. Ah, yeah. I remember then they remodeled and you hired me back. I wouldn't hire you again to wash my clothes, he snapped. Found out your grandpa bought it after firing me. Kyle's jaw dropped and eyes locked on Albert, unable to speak. Yeah, well heard he hired you right back after. Bet you like that. I didn't know. You know, I'll tell you one thing you should know, and that's that I had been working there since I was in high school. Yeah, just like you. Ten years and had been a manager for four. And all it took was about six months with some snotty-nosed rich kid to take it all away. Kyle stood there, speechless realizing a wrong he never knew was committed. I don't know if you remember this, but my wife was pregnant. Yeah, but then again, why would you care anyway? Probably went off to go live off a damn trust fund or something. A large bolt of lightning came from the gray sky and struck a tree nearby with so much force that it crashed to the ground, causing both of the men's hearts to race. This was another feature of the realm he was now in. He had been warned by others shortly after arriving, that using profanity angers who they assume is God and would only be tolerated in limit. I'll never get used to this, Albert said, regaining his composure after the thunder subsided. I didn't know that had happened. With the theater, I mean, Kyle replied. Well, I guess it doesn't matter now, right? Albert asked, continuing to walk in his original direction before putting his hands on his hips and turning around. But then again, maybe if it didn't, I wouldn't be here now again with you, he continued as his gaze turned into a glare which intensified. Kyle took a big inhale, offering, Maybe there's a way I can help you get out of here. That's the only way I can think of to help. Have you forgiven someone? If you forgive me, then at least you would be halfway done. How long have you been here? About thirteen years, Albert answered, causing Kyle to gasp, realizing that he hadn't been there half as long yet. You look surprised. I was already thirty-five when you met me. Walking up to Albert, he asked, So do you want to try it? Albert tilted his head before Kyle clarified, Forgiving me. I mean, I know that I don't deserve it. But if it helps you, and you haven't yet, then maybe you can get out of here. The two men looked at each other before Albert looked at the sky for a moment. Looking down and locking eyes with Kyle, he said, All right, I forgive you. The two remained peering into each other's pupils for seconds until Albert looked up once again. It didn't work he said, facial expression unchanging from before. Kyle's eyes darted from left to right before beginning. But I thought, it has to be sincere, Albert said, winking at him before turning his back and continuing on the path. Kyle watched the man go away, standing in the same position before relaxing his muscles and exhaling. It wasn't as simple as he had thought, and still he had found no one to forgive or vice versa. He already grew both restless and bored, fearing the state of his emotions if he had to be there for as long as Albert, as if that mattered. Still, he was determined to keep his focus on the main goal, and had seventy-five years to do so. Years later, while lying by the river, he heard the log a few feet above him move. Curious, he lifted his head to see someone had just sat down to take a rest. Not having seen anyone for days, he walked over to the man, an older man, a man he recognized, a man he loved a man he adored. The man had the same expression on his face as the two stare at each other until his grandfather gets up and hugs him, and they embrace like they haven't seen each other in years. Because they hadn't. Alan was a wealthy and ruthless business investor. When Kyle's parents, their daughter Zoe and son-in-law Luca, died when he was two, Alan and his wife Odessa took him in. Alan always resented Kyle's father, for the happy-go-lucky lifestyle he led and his daughter's attraction to it. 
What he resented the most is he believed the same lifestyle led to her death. Luca, her Italian painter, had taken her on a trip back home and asked Alan and Odessa if they could watch him for two weeks. One day while visiting, the young couple decided to ski in the Alps. After no one had heard from them, a search was launched. And for months, Alan believed Luca had killed Zoe, and his family was hiding him. He spent thousands on investigators to find what he believed the truth until their bodies were found six months later and 15 feet apart. The cause of death was deemed to be an avalanche. For years, Alan and Odessa raised Kyle, although Odessa was with him the most since her husband's work drive was still as high as the day she married him years ago. Still, Alan loved his grandson, secretly wanting a boy all along, even though he had doted over his late daughter. Kyle grew to look up to his grandfather. People knew their family everywhere they went and were treated as town celebrities. Kyle was spoiled and went to the absolute best schools, owning a car that was nicer than most adults by age 15. Despite this, Alan still didn't want to possibly exacerbate the trait of what he deemed his father's laziness, in the case it may be hereditary. To lessen this possibility, although he paid for his time at Stanford, left little financial support after. Still, Kyle visited often, and since his grandfather was well known even outside of the city, had little trouble finding work. Alan died years after Odessa, a few years after Liam was born. How? the men ask, releasing their embrace. Alan takes a seat back on the log and Kyle follows suit beside him. I still can't believe it's you, Alan said, smiling. It's good to see you, Grandpa. So what in the heck happened? Why are you here? One of my potential clients wanted more than a house tour. Oh, that's just awful. I hope Deborah is all right. Ah, uh, and Liam. But he should be older now. Still, that's terrible. You know I mentioned that you should carry that gun I bought for your 23rd birthday. Grandpa, I haven't touched that thing since we moved. How is my great-grandson and Deborah? Ah, uh, they were fine. I mean, Deborah and I divorced about a year back, and Liam, he's going through his own issues. I'm sure he'll work it out. That boy always seemed bright. He was only five when you passed. That's right, but I could always tell. Same way I could with you. Kyle smiled. I always knew you would make it. Sorry to hear about you and Deborah, though. You know your Nana Odessa liked her. No, it's fine. It was mostly my fault anyway. Yeah, I imagined. Otherwise, why else would you be here? Alan joked. I meant to tell you that I saw your old boss. You know the one that worked at the movie theater? Yes, I uh, saw him too, Kyle said, looking down. Just as mean as ever. No wonder he's here. Heard he died of a heart attack. That wasn't a surprise either. What'd he say to you? Alan asked. He basically told me that he hated me. He told me about what you did to him after I got fired also. Alan turned away, looking off into the forest and said, I certainly have made my share of mistakes. Luckily, your Odessa was praying for me. She's already up there from what Julius said. You met Julius too? Of course. Apparently he handles everyone. Asked him about some other relatives too. They weren't so lucky, Alan said, looking back at him. But yes, I guess all of those times she would go to church and pray for me. Helped. Well, that and all the money we gave away. It's not like you were all that bad, Grandpa. You taught me everything I know. I don't even think I ever saw you really do anything worth going to hell over. I thought the same thing, unfortunately, Alan said, standing up as he picked up a handful of small rocks before throwing and skipping it against a nearby pond's surface. They would occasionally do this in the pond behind the mansion Kyle grew up in. Kyle joined him throwing the small, oval granite piece, bouncing it six times, nearly clearing the water. You always had an arm, Alan smiled. Yeah, but I ended up wanting to do something corporate, a little more practical. Practical, Alan said, skipping the rocks even harder at the water. Do you remember your ninth birthday? He asked, not taking his eyes off of the pond. No, what happened? He finally looked at him and asked. Johnny? Kyle stared blankly. Don't remember him? Johnny Bainsfall? Oh, my best friend, he exclaimed as mounds of memories rushed to his head. Well, up until high school when he went to the other district. Right. You don't remember what happened on your ninth birthday? No, Grandpa, I'm drawing a blank. Team Badgers? He was the catcher and they needed a pitcher. But I had never played before, so I couldn't do it. Why? Did they have a game on my birthday and I couldn't go or something? Alan dropped the rocks he was holding, looking at Kyle, while he did the same. 
Johnny asked if you wanted to be on the team with him. He was your best friend because he was one of your only friends. Even though he wasn't even middle class, I allowed the friendship because I thought it would be good for you. Maybe help your diversity communication. Oh, I remember. Right, he asked me to be on the team and I tried out and made the team, but the first game was on my birthday. I think that's why I wasn't able to make it. You weren't able to make it because I didn't let you. I never was the biggest fan of sports, but your father loved baseball. I hadn't found out that you tried out until after you made the team. To me, learning business was far more important than learning sports. Taxes, Kyle blurted. I remember you made me learn how to do my taxes. You made me write an essay on it and everything. Yes, on your birthday. I wanted you to learn how to do taxes. If you remember, I asked you a week before, but... But I forgot. I forgot because I made the team. Right. You were so excited and I felt terrible but thought that this was more important. Odessa didn't speak to me for a week. I remember you cried like a baby that night after turning in your paper. Could barely read it because of the tears, he said as his eyes too began to water. But it was more important for me, Grandpa, he said, walking up and grabbing his arm. It taught me to keep my promises. It taught me discipline. And most importantly, it taught me taxes, Kyle smiled. Nothing would have ever came of me playing baseball anyway, you know that. I wasn't near good enough and it's not about how good you were, he interrupted. It's about allowing you to be a child, to have fun, to live, enjoy life, enjoy your birthdays and chase your dreams, not being over-consumed with an adult world years away. Odessa was right, he said, turning his back and lowering his head. Kyle rushed to comfort the weeping man, getting in front of him and saying, Grandpa, you did the best you could. You got me everything I wanted and took care of all of my needs. That trust fund you set up helped my family set up a life. The only thing was I had to work for it, which I was more than proud and happy to do. It gave me a strong work ethic and gave me something to aspire to. Aspirations can wait. I should have been there more. Yes, work took much of my time, but I didn't need to. I just wanted to because that's what I loved. All the while neglecting to show love to you. The gifts I bought you were mainly to make up for the time I neglected to raise you. Not about business, but about being a man, being in a relationship, having integrity. You want to know what I was doing when you were writing that essay on your birthday? Kyle tilted his head. I was golfing. The least I could have done was be there with you. I did a great disservice to you, son. And for that I am forever regretful. Kyle put his hand on the old man's shoulder, saying, You did the best you could. I couldn't have asked for a bet. Don't say that, Alan said. I have no doubt that your father would have been a better example than me, and I could have done much better. Do you know why I was so hard on you? Kyle moved his hand from Alan's shoulder, saying, You just wanted me to be successful. No, son. That may have been a part of it, but it was because I didn't want you to end up like your father. He had such a happy-go-lucky, carefree attitude, seeming to always go along with the wind. Maybe I was jealous. I see why your mother was attracted to him. Grandpa, look. The old man raised his head. We all could have been better parents. I had a great life, an amazing life for the most part, although it was cut short. Alan looked directly at Kyle with swelled eyes and asked, May I ask you a question? Yes, anything, Grandpa. Alan angled his head downward again before taking Kyle by the arm and asking, Will you forgive me? Kyle took an inhale, putting his hand to his chest as his jaw widened. I didn't think I needed to. You did everything for me. If anything, I'm the disappointment. Alan took a step closer and said, You are no disappointment. I couldn't have asked for a better son, to which Kyle brought his hand to his forehead and begun to cry as well. Still, will you do this for me? Alan repeated. Kyle grabbed both of his hands and said, I forgive you, barely able to get the words out. Soon after that, a small, bright light appeared above that grew bigger by the second. The men looked up but were nearly blinded, so had to turn away quickly. Thank you, Alan said, and the men embraced. Kyle was thrown back by the beam of light that now reached the earth encircling Alan. As he was getting back up, Alan looked up toward the sky and then back down at Kyle, saying, Wish me luck at court. Good luck. But before Kyle could get the words out, Alan was thrust into the beam of light and into the sky in what seemed like an instant. Kyle stood up and looked to the sky, realizing he was yet alone again, but with a silver lining. There was hope. He was thankful to have seen again and helped his grandfather, but was now eager to get back on his journey. Kyle continued to walk through the forest for many years, seeing others, 
but no more that he knew until one day. He had been there about forty years, but had hope since already completing one half of his goal. It was night, but the stars dimly lit the area around as Kyle sat down to lean against a pine tree for some rest. Just as he was closing his eyes, he heard something. It sounded like sobbing. Although the person was far away, their cries still echoed through the woods. Kyle was used to cries in the night, but this seemed a little more familiar, and since it prohibited his slumber, decided to go check it out. He got up and walked toward the sounds, and as he walked they grew louder. He soon reached a small clearing where he found the origin. In the middle was a rock nearly the size of him. A man who was facing away was kneeling on the ground while he rested his upper torso on the rock, burying his face in the crevices as droplets of water hit the dirt around his knees. After satisfying his curiosity, Kyle turned away, beginning to walk back the direction he came until breaking a branch he stepped on. The man who had been crying stopped and looked back toward the noise. Who is that? Do I know you? The man asked, standing upright. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to disturb. Was just passing through, Kyle replied, stepping into the starlight to show his face. After a while, the man began running toward him, glimpses of his face only visible for a second. Even still, long enough for Kyle to recognize him, as he too began to walk slowly forward. The impact was immense as the man collided with Kyle, missing his face by mere millimeters, causing them both to fall to the ground. Their tears together would have filled a pool as they sat up, as if they were wrestling for the stronger embrace. Dad! Liam screamed, still hugging Kyle as they stood. This went on for many minutes until Kyle drew back and said, Liam! They both withdrew their embrace, still holding onto each other's arms. Dad! he asked. What happened? Kyle explained how he died and everything that had been going on with the family since he left. Shortly after the settlement went in their favor, Liam had gone missing. Kyle and Deborah looked far and wide for their son, but couldn't come up with anything. Things went south between them, and divorce was filed soon after. What happened with you? Kyle asked. After the settlement, I kind of went my own way. What do you mean? I mean just that, Dad. I went my own way. I went the way the world was calling me. I went to what was comfortable. What do you mean, what was comfortable? I mean something I knew, something I felt comfortable with, somewhere, somewhere I felt I could relax. You could have always come home, son, Kyle said, putting a hand on Liam's shoulder. What home, Dad? Liam yelled, pulling away. You and Mom were arguing every second. That's when you were even there. There were nights I couldn't even sleep. I'm sorry, son, Kyle said, taking a step closer. Don't be, Liam said, snatching away. You had years to be sorry. You and Mom. I, we never meant it to be like this, son. I didn't know you felt like that. I know, Dad, Liam said, turning and walking away. Turning around, he said, I didn't tell you a lot. What happened? Kyle repeated. Why were you gone so long? Liam turned around, saying, I left because I didn't feel like I belonged. What do you mean you didn't feel like you belonged? We made everything as easy as possible. Are you saying you weren't loved? Your mother and I loved you more than- I know you loved me, Dad. Don't get upset, please. I just had different needs that you couldn't meet. You didn't know how to meet. That doesn't mean weren't a good parent. That just means that I couldn't communicate to you the way I needed to. I'm not upset, son. If anything, more confused than anything. What happened? Meaning how did you get here? Shortly after the settlement, Liam fell into a deep depression, resorting to alcohol and drugs. Spending a few months in L.A. and Vegas, he decided it was too close to home and moved to Thailand where he changed his number. One night in Phuket after a group orgy and another bender, Liam decided to take one too many pills, waking up in the same red outfit in the same room Kyle was introduced to after his passing. Kyle took a few steps back stumbling before regaining his balance as his son watched on, approaching to assist, but Kyle managed to recompose, grabbing the side of his head with both of his hands while running his fingers through the grayish follicles. He began to pace in circles. What's wrong, Dad? Liam asked. Kyle stopped pacing, bringing his hands back down to his sides. Standing sideways, he looked to the left toward Liam and said, What's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? I just found out my son died and I wasn't there for him, he moaned. Liam walked up to his dad, saying, but you're here for me now. Kyle couldn't control the avalanche of tears bombarding his eyelids before Liam, without warning, hugged him again. 
What seemed like minutes passed until the men stepped back, still partially holding the other. Wait, Kyle said, as his eyes grew more intense and Liam leaned forward. Have you... were you able to fulfill any of the tests? Tests? Yeah. Have you forgiven anyone or been forgiven? That's all you have to do to get out of here. I actually saw your great-grandfather years ago and we exchanged and when I forgave him he ascended up with a light. I meant to tell you that I saw him. Man, Liam said. Papa Allen was here? Kyle nodded his head. I barely even remember him, but I do remember the Rolex he got me for my fifth birthday. Ah, yes, Kyle perked up, saying. Did you keep it? Liam looked down and away before replying, Nah, no, Dad. I didn't. I kind of ran into some trouble at the end and had to pawn it. Sorry, Dad, he continued after seeing the look on his face. Kyle took a step closer, saying, Son, there isn't a damn thing you need to be sorry to me for, followed by the sound of a strike of lightning nearby, accompanied by light thunder. The father-son duo looked up until it went back silent. Thanks, Dad. Wish I could have seen Papa Allen. But no, a few years ago I forgave someone and saw the same thing. But they still had their other half to finish, too. Maybe I could ask you to forgive me for leaving. Or maybe just getting in so much trouble in the first place. I really put you and Mom through a lot, and I recognize that no, son, Kyle interrupted. Please don't. You were a kid. I was a man, Dad. I just wish I had been better. Don't we all, son? Don't we all? He replied before saying, Well, let's give it a shot, and took his son by the hands. The men looked into each other's eyes before Kyle says, Here goes nothing. I forgive you. The two looked up and waited, but nothing appeared. There was no light, no beam, nothing. Liam chuckled, saying, I guess it only works when you haven't already forgiven someone. I guess so, Kyle responded, halfway regretting forgiving Alan so many years ago. It's all right, Dad. I'll find my way, Liam said. They stayed up all night and most of the next day talking, spending nearly a month together before parting ways again, wishing each other luck. Once Kyle was alone again, he could not get his son off of his mind. Falling into a deep depression, him being pardoned didn't weigh as heavily on his mind as before. All he could think of was Liam, how he failed him, how he lost him. One night, he did something he hadn't done since his grandmother took him to church when he was younger prayed. He stumbled to his knees and let out a ragged sob. His hands trembled as he curled them into fists, pressing them to his forehead in desperation. God, I'm unworthy of your forgiveness, he cried. I should go to hell. Tears streamed down his face as he bowed his head in despair. He slouched in hopelessness, shuffling his feet as he meandered through the dense forest. He had been walking for hours, and the darkness of night was fast approaching. His mind full of regret from seven long years ago, he barely noticed the woman walking towards him until she touched his arm gently and spoke his name. Kyle? Profess, Professor? Brinks? Oh, you remember? Well, I mean, you were the only teacher that failed me in college. But that's not what got me fired, just what got me noticed. What got me fired was my complaint after your harassment. It was a joke. You tried to get me expelled. And you should have been. I didn't give you my personal phone number so that you could send a dick pic. Yes, I know, but I was drunk. Look, I know that's no excuse, but I just the nerve of you to ask me anything. You know, after I kept making those complaints and you were back in my class after I had failed you the first time I threatened to go to the police. I guess once Mr. Doler got wind of it being that he was a big donor and all finally got fed up and gave his fraternity brother the dean a call. I was given an ultimatum. Either I let it go or be let go. I chose the latter. Well, little did I know that your grandfather was also a donor for the police department as well. Let's just say the investigation didn't really go too well, since they said they couldn't prove it was your penis. Look, I'm sorry. How did you get here? Funny that you ask. After I got fired, I got accepted to a new job at a private college not too far away. I actually began to love it pretty quickly. As she continued, Kyle struggled to maintain eye contact. Well. That went completely out the window after two months, and now I'm here. Wait, so you've been here for a lot longer than you, she blurted. I'm so sorry, Kyle said. Yeah, me too. Kyle's face flushed a deep red, and his Adam's apple bobbed anxiously as he tried to think of an appropriate response. His gaze dropped to the floor, and he took a halting step back. She said his name in a soft voice, but he didn't look up. 
Instead, he shuffled away without speaking. Part 5 Kyle looked back, his face still flushed red. I'm so sorry, he whispered, his voice barely audible. She smiled softly at him and stepped towards him, resting a hand gently on his shoulder. It's okay, she said. I understand. She paused for a moment, then began to quote Alice Miller. Genuine forgiveness does not deny anger but faces it head on. Kyle nodded slowly as he listened to her words. He looked up and met her gaze squarely, the first time since the whole incident had occurred, and nodded again. Thank you, he said simply. She gave his shoulder a light squeeze before stepping back. She had forgiven him, allowing their eyes to meet once more. There was understanding in her gaze, understanding of what had happened and what they both had gone through, and she offered him a small smile in response before turning away. Kyle felt an overwhelming sense of relief wash over him in that moment, though he knew he couldn't undo what had been done. He could at least take comfort in the fact that someone else understood his story and was willing to forgive him for it. Taking a deep breath, Kyle also turned away, before a bright light shot down from the heavens, surrounding them and lifting them off the ground. While spinning in a clockwise motion, they rose up into the sky until they were no longer visible below. Kyle finds himself in a large room made of cool, white marble. The floor was tile, and in the center was a circle of iron benches. Off to one side was a statue of Mary of Clopas, and on the other, sitting upon a throne carved from bone and woven with ivy and sap, was Julius, who had grown gaunt. His eyes blazed with green fire as he congratulated Kyle on getting out of the nether realm. Kyle was taken aback by this new form, but happy that the wait was finally over. Julius looked down at Kyle his face full of compassionate judgment. You are accepted into the court, he stated. If you are pardoned, you must spend three hundred years in purgatory, living by God's laws. No sins can be committed during this time. Kyle nodded, a lump forming in his throat. Three hundred years seemed like an eternity. He had already done so much time in the nether realm, but it was a small price to pay for being pardoned and accepted back into God's grace. He bowed his head in reverence and thanked Julius for giving him this chance. Julius's face, unchanged, waved his hand towards the door. As Kyle walked through it, he looks back and just as he was about to thank him again, the door disappears and he is transported to a lone seat in a courtroom. The courtroom was large and imposing, the walls a bright amber that almost seemed to be illuminated. Kyle sat quietly in his red suit, among an audience of people that were all dressed in white. He felt small and out of place in his red clothing, but he tried to remain stoic as he waited for the proceedings to begin. A large man in what looked like a warrior's outfit stood near the bench. Suddenly, a man broke through the crowd and made his way towards Kyle. He was a tall man with a booming voice, and he introduced himself as Kyle's defense attorney. Johnny Cochran soon followed him, the prosecutor wearing a white shiny ring as if it was armor against any words spoken in the courtroom. Kyle felt a jolt of surprise when he saw the familiar face of Cochran standing in front of him. His attorney put his hand on Kyle's shoulder and said, Nice to meet you, Mr. Dohler, extending his hand. Clarence Darrow at your service, he ended as the two men shook. Kyle put his hand to his chest at a loss for words before Darrow then gestured to the large man at the bench. That is Samson. Kyle jerked his head back toward Darrow. Yes, from the Bible to which Kyle just shook his head and looked up before Darrow continued. Look, you have a good chance, Kyle, and it looks as if you may be forgiven. A spark of hope ignited in Kyle's chest, and for the first time in a long time, he allowed himself to feel optimism. Finally, the judge entered. Everyone stood up from their seats and silenced themselves as the man presented himself. It was Job, from the Bible, dressed in golden-colored garments. Job hit down his gavel with authority, and everyone took their places again. It was time for the trial to begin as the entire courtroom took their seats. Kyle Dohler, Job says, and both Kyle and Darrow stood up as well as Johnny Cochran. You have committed multiple sins against God. What does he have to say for himself? We humbly request forgiveness, Darrow responded. Mr. Dohler has already completed the tasks required of him in purgatory. Job sat back in his seat, saying, True, but there are still a few more matters that need to be addressed. Prosecutor Cochran, what have you say? Your Honor, this man should under no circumstances whatsoever be saved. 
aside from all of the other things he's done, he's taken so much from others. Case in point, Cochran said. He waved his hand, and a shimmering portal opened up in the courtroom, hovering above their heads. The indistinct image within was another scene from Kyle's former life as the court watched silently. Kyle and Otto stepped out of the car inch by inch, craning their necks to look up at the dismal sight before them. The sixes stood like a giant monolith, its once glorious marquee now faded, the gold leaf flaking away from the glass panels. Below, a dirt parking lot was littered with trash and marked with orange cones that were in danger of tipping over. Beyond the rusty chain-link fence, an expanse of empty land was dotted with piles of debris. As they surveyed their surroundings, Kyle could feel a sense of opportunity. Otto looked at Kyle, rubbing a hand over his bald head, worry lines creasing his forehead. You think these folks will give us a hard time about leaving? he asked quietly. Kyle gave a low chuckle and tapped the briefcase full of checks and eviction notices that lay between them. With as much cash as we're giving them? No, I doubt we'll have any problems. They don't know how much this is really worth. Besides, if we don't take it, the city will. Otto nodded, but the anxiety in his expression didn't dissipate. Cochran walks toward the portal as it changes to another scene. The portal now shows a happy black family having a barbecue in front of the apartment building. The crowd around them breaks out in applause. A mother, father, son, and daughter are standing behind the grill with metal spatulas in hand, each of them wearing chef's hats. Two boys run in circles around the patio table and jabber to one another in their excitement as they load burgers onto their plastic plates. A little girl claps her hands and giggles at each bite she takes of her ice cream cone. Here is a family you displaced. One of them, Cochran said, pointing. Five years after, the parents were split and the kids were already in the system. Kyle looked down. What of their happiness? Kyle had never felt more embarrassed. Your Honor, it's a capitalist society, Darrow stated. Everyone in here knows that's how America runs. How was Mr. Dolor supposed to know that would happen? As far as I could tell, he thought he was just doing his job. Ah, uh, yes, his job, Cochran smirked and said. Seems like his job isn't the only thing your representee was doing. Kyle looked up and saw Cochran had opened the portal again. This time, the scene showed Otto's wife, Regina. Otto had taken the day off, but Regina also worked at the real estate office with Kyle. She and Kyle were the only ones there that late night as they toiled over new prospects. Once they were done, they celebrated with a glass of wine at the same desk they had been working. I don't know. It's just that he's so boring. I mean, come on, Regina said with a smirk. I mean, Otto's a little bit older, so I understand, Kyle laughed. Oh, how's Deborah doing? Man, Kyle exhaled. Every time we want to go out and do something, we always end up arguing over the most minute things. I swear, Liam's been skipping school and it's stressing us both out. Regina lifted her glass of red wine, saying, A toast, to de-stress. After the two had toasted, they continued drinking and talking for hours, not realizing the time. Oh, I guess I gotta get going home, Kyle said. Yeah, me too, Regina bemoaned. As the two arose, Regina somewhat struggled to get to her feet, causing Kyle to react and catch her. She looked up and smiled before the two locked eyes. He pulled her closer and she abruptly grabbed the back of his head and the two began to kiss. They laughed as they shucked off their clothing, two adults stifling giggles like naughty children peeling off layers of winter clothes until they could run naked through the streets of a busy city. One of his shoes disappeared under a corner of a desk, but he didn't care because all that mattered was her delicate touch against his skin. The scene in the portal then turned blurry easing Kyle's newfound humiliation, but not much. Cochran then turned to the defendant with a scowl, saying, You failed to realize that the pact of marriage is not only a promise between two humans, but of God as well. When you break that oath, you not only destroy a family, but also trust. How can your Creator believe you will be faithful to Him in eternity if you cannot even maintain the bond with your wife during your earthly life? The famed Simpson lawyer then walked right in front of Kyle, looking him directly in the eye, and said, if the shoe fits, you must get lit. After this was said and Cochran took his seat, it was now Darrow's turn. Yes, marriage is a pact, Johnny, he began. You should know that more than anyone, he said with a slight smile, causing Cochran to be embarrassed. Besides, Mr. and Mrs. Dolor were planning on getting a divorce to add a bit of context. Neither were happy your honor and these things happen, albeit unfortunate. Seeking happiness outside of God is a cause in vain, Job said. 
Darrow looked down at Kyle and then back up to Job, saying, A man once said that lost causes are the only ones worth fighting for. A break was taken while the small panel of twelve individuals pondered the case. Kyle was astonished to find Gandhi and Thurgood Marshall included in the jury. Minutes later, Kyle is called back in the courtroom as his heart races, where he takes back his seat next to Darrow. The jury raised their heads to deliver the verdict. We find him guilty! Gandhi spoke slowly and deliberately, his voice echoing through the packed courtroom like a bell tolling for the condemned. Kyle felt his stomach plummet to the place he was soon to go. He could sense the taste of bile at the back of his throat before Gandhi continued, but worthy of purgatory as a path to forgiveness. The words were like a balm to Kyle's soul, soothing his spirit and wrapping around him like a comforting shroud. His eyes closed and he took a deep breath before opening them again. Kyle looked up at Darrow, who stood beside him with a stoic expression on his face, and then back down at the floor. Tears streamed down his cheeks as he repeated, Thank you so much, hugging Darrow tightly in gratitude before realizing what his attorney was looking at. Job sat up, looking Kyle up and down, narrowing his nose and tightening his lips. Part 6 I want to thank the jury for their deliberation and subsequent judgment, Job said, looking over to them. And although I value that judgment, I must disagree, he continued, looking directly at Kyle. I am not convinced that you are fully repentant. Throughout your entire life you chose sin. The only times you chose good was when it benefited you and your family. For this reason, I must send you to hell, he concluded, slamming the gavel one final time. Darrow inhaled, looking down at Kyle as he collapsed on the floor. Helping him up, Darrow called, Your Honor! But it was already too late. Within an instant, Kyle was whisked away to the top of the same stairwell he passed earlier. As he moved closer, a scorching heat seeped into his skin. Accompanying him are two faceless guardians in black, their hands clamped tightly onto his arms, pushing him steadily downwards. Kyle does not try to fight it. His feet move of their own accord, and in moments, they have reached the bottom steps. At the end looms an immense gate, the gates of hell, with screams of agony pouring out from its cracked lips. Kyle's eyes grew wide and whole body began to shake. The gate swings open by itself as if powered by an unknown force ready to swallow Kyle whole when a thunderous voice says behind them, Stop! Kyle whips around, his heart pounding in his chest. He is stopped short by the sight of the guards bowing at a figure. As Jesus steps forward, seemingly floating, Kyle felt like time came to a standstill. He places a hand on Kyle's head, causing his whole body to shudder as lightning courses through him. You are forgiven, he says. Kyle's heart races as Jesus lifts his hand, a wave of adrenaline and exhilaration flooding his veins. How? I don't deserve forgiveness. I hate myself. He looked at him with a curious compassion before smiling and asking, How can you hate something your Creator made? The reason you were condemned was because you didn't believe and now you do. You have changed, he smiled. Now go do good, he concluded, waving his hand and Kyle was suddenly now moving at a pace that everything around was a blur. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew that he was afraid. Landing on a road near a building in a small town, he regained his composure and stood up to view his surroundings on this bright summer day. He hadn't seen the sun since he was alive and stood there for minutes gazing up until someone tapped him on the shoulder. Um, sorry to disturb you, the man said. Are you Mr. Kyle Doler? Uh, yes. Where am I? Welcome to Purgatory. I'm Henry, your guide. Kyle grinned more than he remembered ever having done. I'm the receiver. Let me show you around, he said, gesturing, and the men began to walk. The buildings gleamed, and cobblestone streets were lined with quaint cafes and shops. So this'll be your home for the next three hundred years. If you're lucky, he joked. Kyle feigned a grin despite not finding that joke particularly amusing. Let me know if you need anything. It's a relatively small town. Couple thousand of us. Wait, is that? Yep, Whitney Houston. She sings at the show house from time to time. You'll see a lot of people you know, I'd imagine. Or hopefully, rather. How long have you been here, if you don't mind me asking? 289 years and counting, he said, puffing his chest out as they stopped in front of a small home something Kyle could have bought twenty of before. This'll be where you're staying. It's a two-bedroom and you'll have a roommate for now until we get some more people out of the solitary homes. 
If you need anything, I'm right up the street in the big greenhouse. Kyle nodded, looking back toward the large, emerald-colored mansion-like home. Anything else I should know? You'll pick up on it all. Just remember, one rule, do not sin. Any questions about that? There's a thick black book in there on your bed that'll answer everything, he smiled. Great, got it. I really appreciate it. Henry left and Kyle decided to do more exploring, where he learned that church wasn't just once a week but every day, not to mention mandatory. After seeing Robin Williams and DMX having a conversation at a coffee shop, he decided it best not to interrupt, at least for now, and check out his new place. Kyle looked around the two-bedroom home. It was small but nice and tidy. The kitchen had a picturesque window overlooking the well-kept lawn, framed by potted plants interspersed with arranged wooden furniture for a comfortable place to lounge about outside. The house was built in a style that resembled more like an English cottage than a typical American home, which Kyle liked. It reminded him of quaint little places he had visited in Europe on vacations abroad. In the living area, there was a built-in bookshelf filled with hardcover copies of timeless classics. His roommate wasn't there and had the door closed. The inside smelled lighter and cleaner than Kyle expected. He hears someone at his front door and assumes that it must be his roommate. Kyle walks down to greet them, a smile plastered on his face. The man is faced away from Kyle as he closes the door behind him. Turning around, his roommate drops his bags, as shocked as Kyle is. Kyle stumbles back, nearly falling but catching himself on the wall. A mixture of both fear and anger encompasses him as he realizes that his new roommate is one of the same men that killed him. The End